Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Mental Health Professionals Network webinar. Um, it's very exciting tonight to have a, a general practitioner audience. Currently, we have 65 GPs online, and we have um, over 160 registered. So hopefully, some more will join us through the evening. So this is an interdisciplinary panel discussion about recognising and responding to complex trauma. Um, Mental Health Professionals Network would like to acknowledge the support of the Adult Surviving Child Abuse, ASCA organisation, which is really useful to know about as a GP. They have a great website and we'll be hearing some more about the work of ASCA throughout the evening, including um, their excellent principles in caring for people who have experienced complex trauma. Mental Health Professionals Network is funded by the Commonwealth Department of Social Services. Um, to deliver this professional development series of three webinars. So tonight's just the first and we'll be meeting Tanya tonight, our patients, and um, we'll follow through managing her care in the subsequent two webinars which will be open to other disciplines who work under Medicare. Um, so this is for practitioners who support individuals and communities affected by or engaging in the Royal Commission in, into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. So that's a very current um, issue in Australia and some funding um, was granted to help raise awareness for practitioners who will and already do see people affected by these issues. So I'd like to, my name's Mary Amelias, I'm a GP in uh, Cairns in far north Queensland. I work at a Headspace site and I worked previously at Headspace in Townsville. Um, many of the young people that I see have experienced complex trauma. So this is a particular interest of mine and I'm also um, have, am pleased to have been involved with the MHPN including the national webinars for a couple of years. Um, I'd like to welcome our panellists tonight. There was information provided about their backgrounds um, as part of the materials for tonight's webinar. So Cathy Kesselman is a GP and tonight she's um, here representing ASCAR and also as our consumer advocate. Cathy, Welcome, and I wonder where you are, and if you'd like to comment on anything about where you are tonight. I'm in Sydney in my study. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Cathy. Um, now, David, you're in a genuine rural practice in Longreach in uh, Western Queensland. How are things in Longreach this evening? They're very good. Thank you, Mary. It's, um, it's very warm, but a uh, very nice night, and I'm, I'm in at the practice, so it's nice and quiet. My uh, two-year-old wasn't party to the webinar tonight, so uh, I had to come in here. So there are things that may be more attractive about being online in front of 100 people. Yeah, um, he, uh, he would have enjoyed being online as well, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> now Iggy, um, Iggy is a mental health nurse with a lot of experience in this field, and I understand Iggy that you've just recently moved to Tasmania. How's, um, yeah. how's that been for you? It's been great. No turning back. It's uh, beautiful down here. A little bit uh, on the chilly side today, but uh, lovely. Great mountain views. Welcome, Iggy. And um, Professor Louise Newman is the psychiatrist on our panel tonight. And Louise will may be well known to many of you um, for a lot of the things that she gets asked to comment on in the media. And I wondered, Louise, if you wanted to just say a little bit about where you are this evening and about your interest in complex trauma. Sure. Look, I've worked in this sort of area for most of my career. I mainly work with children. I was very interested in the impact of these sorts of traumas on child development. Most of my research in my academic life is looking at the developmental implications of child abuse and maltreatment. Uh, and importantly, better ways of uh, looking at interventions um, for this group. So I'm uh, very much interested in trauma, um, including not only um, child abuse and maltreatment, but trauma um, that uh, at the moment um, is very topical and that, that's trauma to refugees, particularly asylum seeking children. Thank you Louise and welcome to the panel. Um, so just many of the um, participants tonight might, might not be used to the format here, so just a few ground rules um, just to make sure that everyone is aware. You do have a chat box um, underneath the window where the slides and the um, pictures are. There's an orange box that will be flushing that says general chat. Now you can chat to each other in that box, participants, and the um, panellists can also 
see that and may join in the conversation. Um, please feel free to support each other as you already have been. Um, just be respectful of each other and remember that everybody can read what you write in the chat box. Um, the other thing is it's really important is your feedback and Mental Health Professionals Network have um, tailored the webinar program often according to the feedback and requests from participants. So please stay online when we finish and help um, by completing a short exit survey. And in a couple of weeks you will receive an attendance certificate if you need that for any purpose. Now the learning objectives for tonight have also come out to you beforehand and this is a really important and practical topic and I can speak for myself in that having an understanding of trauma has actually transformed my experience of general practice. Um, so our um, learning objectives tonight are to understand the prevalence, epidemiology, characteristics and impact of complex trauma to be better equipped to recognise the physical, mental and psychosocial presentations which might indicate unresolved trauma and to acquire tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration to support people who've been exposed to or experienced complex trauma. Um, before I zip onto that slide, um, I would just, so what, what will happen this evening is that um, each of the panellists will give a response to Tanya, if they were to meet her, how they would respond from their perspective. Um, we've asked people to be as honest as possible um, and also to give us their expertise and I think you'll learn a lot from those brief presentations. And then um, Kathy, we'll come back to Kathy who's going to give us um, an overview of the principles of the ASCA Trauma Informed Care Guidelines which is really uh, useful for us. And then we will proceed to a discussion between the panellists um, about what comes out of uh, a response to Tanya. Now thank you for everyone who submitted questions before the webinar. I will do my best to um, try and ensure that we cover as much of those topics as we can. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that we are not trying to resolve everything in Tanya's care in an hour discussion and just as we would most likely be following her for years as DPs, um, most likely how you'll feel at the end of this evening's presentation is that you'll have learnt a lot and there'll still be, for Tanya, a whole lot of unanswered questions. So please don't feel too frustrated if um, things that you consider obvious are not yet being addressed. And please come back for the subsequent two webinars. Um, so I would like to first of all uh, hand over to Cathy, who's representing Tanya, I guess. So you've probably all read the case study beforehand. Brief summary, um, Tanya is 36. She's presented at the GP um, with some signs and symptoms that might be perhaps challenging in a general practice setting. Um, and they might indicate that she has experienced or been exposed to complex trauma. So Cathy, um, welcome and thanks for letting us know how you would respond to Tanya's situation and think about trauma. Mm. Look, thanks so much, Mary. Really, um, I'm going to be putting, um, hopefully, uh, complex trauma in a, in a bit of context. And uh, I suppose I'd just start by, you know, having been a GP, I know the challenges of general practice. And the GPs, um, you know, often need to identify, acknowledge and, and, and hold the pain of people's life histories. But I, what, what I didn't know when I was in general practice was the number of people who've experienced um, complex trauma and uh, we know by conservative estimates that's 5 million Australian adults. That means that every day GPs will see a number of people who are experiencing um, the impacts of complex trauma. And these patients have diverse presentations, often multiple comorbidities uh, and additional challenges such as unspecified pain or medically unexplained symptoms. And Tanya is definitely one such patient. Uh, so applying a trauma-informed lens um, helps GPs to recognise the trauma underlying such presentations and to respond appropriately and move away from discrete diagnoses based on presenting symptoms to look at the context of people's lives. So just you know, very briefly, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about trauma? Well, trauma is part of the human condition. I mean, it's impossible to go through life without experiencing trauma. Um, it's a uh, real perceived threat to life, limb, self, threatens to overwhelm the way we cope. And we, t we can talk of classified trauma according to single incident or complex. Single incident 
for example, a sexual physical assault in adulthood, uh, a natural disaster. And obviously, um, they have profound impacts. But complex trauma, when, when trauma, trauma is experienced as a child, it's often repeated, it's often prolonged, it's often extreme. And it occurs during those crucial developmental periods and it's often perpetrated by the very person charged with the child's care. So, you know, obviously that's going to have profound impacts and has profound impacts potentially on the developing, well, on the developing brain and potentially every aspect of a person's functioning as they go through life. So we know that uh, two-thirds of people presenting to public and private mental health services have experienced uh, the trauma of child sexual assault and child physical assault. And this slide here um, looks at 10 categories uh, of adverse childhood experiences and it's taken from um, uh, a very profound study in the States that's been going on for 17 years now called the ACE study. And it shows sadly that the number of ways in which a child can experience trauma uh, and what we know about complex trauma is it becomes cumulative over time. Uh, and the impacts become compounded. Uh, and when we look at uh, Tanya's history, um, and I'm sure if we drill down further, we'd find uh, a number of these different um, traumatic uh, stresses. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy. And um, we'll be coming back to you um, later on to talk a little bit more about the uh, ASCA principles. Now, my, um, I'm in... Uh, by North Queensland and the internet seems to be several seconds slower. So um, I have advanced my slide and I'm just waiting. Now David, you're going to respond to us next and I, I like your first slide, it feels like how I feel right now. <laughs> Thanks David. Thank you very much Mary. Everything's slower in Queensland. The, um, I, I really, when I read Tanya's case um, in preparation for this, this is really the first thing that came to my mind and I guess in some ways to me it reflects what I think is going on at both a practical level in the GP surgery itself but also really in Tanya's life. By the time you get to see Tanya, everyone's going to be just a little bit touchy. You would have already had a call from the reception staff, um, they're going to be upset, Tanya importantly is going to be upset, even other patients may be upset and the place is going to be fairly chaotic by the time you actually reach the right waiting room. And so it got me thinking about how I approach the practical aspects of this in my own practice. And, and you know, it would be really interesting later in the, in the webinar to hear from some of you as to how you in your own practice do this. Because some of the questions I had for you were, what procedures does your practice have in place for this kind of presentation? But also really any kind of emergency presentation. How equipped are your staff for dealing with the, the agitated or the aggressive patient? And what have you got in place for your own safety and for the safety of your other staff and, and also the other patients? So with respect to Sanya, I guess I'm pretty lucky in my practice. I, I, have a, I work amongst a medium-sized practice which is purpose-built. We've got um, quite a lot of um, consulting rooms. And so usually there'd be one free. The other thing that I'm very lucky to have is I have a, a practice nurse with some mental health experience. And so usually if the girls rang me um, and told me that someone like Tanya had presented, you know, as always, it's almost always when you're fully booked, you'll be running 20 minutes late. And what I would normally do is get my practice nurse to, to grab Tanya out of the waiting room, take her into somewhere quiet, and just give her a chance to talk and just to get some stuff off her chest to actually kind of get some of the issues out and to take a lot of kind of the heat out of the situation, if at all possible. Um, I'd normally duck back in and see a couple more patients and then I'd pop back after I'd finished and try and have a kind of a focused consultation with her. And, and to be honest, I'm normally pre I am honest with them. I, I normally explain the kind of logistical problems, the fact that I am late and the fact that, the, that they don't have a formal appointment but really try to explain that I just want to listen and I want to work out what we can do now and then as soon as possible we'll schedule a, a kind of a more appropriate appointment. So you, you've seen your couple more patients and your nurse calls you back in and, and at that point 
I guess that you need to play it a bit by ear. Tanya still might be very upset. She still might be very hostile. She still might not be in the mood to talk to you at all. It sounds from the vignette like I've known her in the past, and so I might kind of use some some of that past history to kind of get her leg in and ask how she's going. But of course, it could also go the other way. You know, perhaps we separated on acrimonious kind of circumstances in the past. So I kind of play it by ear, but really the goal of that appointment for me is to find out what she really, what's really worrying her now. And is it something really simple that you could sort out with a medical certificate or a letter of support, um, something that might help her with regards to paying the rent or to, to get the bank off her back? The other issue is her risk. You know, we hear this ad nauseum, it's drummed into us, and but, but it is important. You know, I think really we have to assess is she at risk to herself? Um, is, is there others at risk? Are there risks that we haven't thought of? You know, is there a risk that she might be homeless tonight? Um, is there a risk that she might go and, you know, reuse drugs or take up some other kind of a, um, detrimental activity? So really, I think considering all of those things and then come up with a plan for what we might do now. So in my mind, if I thought she was safe, um, I'd be working out when I could get her back. I'd be working out, you know, is it worthwhile giving her a small supply of some medications? You know, the use of benzodiazepines is, is controversial and, and I know that, you know, you talk to different GPs and everyone will have their own um, opinion on how they should be used. And everyone's opinions are valid, to be honest. But in my practice, you know, I certainly don't shy away from giving people two or four or six diazepam um, with a view that I'm going to limit their supply and I'm going to see them soon, especially if I know them and, I, and I'm aware of their past history and I'm aware of their social history. The other advantage I've got here is that it's a small town. You know, we all share the on-call. We all know um, rows, and so it's pretty easy to track, keep track of who's doing what. Um, it raises the question of when can you get back? I, I mean, every practice, again, is different as to how they schedule this, but in my opinion, my practice here, we schedule emergency slots that don't open up until 8.30 on the day. Um, they're quite handy. In this situation, I might be able to steal one of tomorrow's emergency slots. Um, I've been here long enough that the girls will let me do that now. Um, but really, every practice is different. But you've got to have some kind of way that you can get Tanya back in at least half an hour's time. You know, 15 minutes is, is really tricky. And I know some of you must be groaning in horror even thinking of giving up half an hour of, of your schedule, but she really needs some time. Um, the thing I would also be thinking about, but not necessarily engaging yet, is, is what other kind of external supports are we going to need in her? Of course, the, the kind of contrary to that is, is if you don't think she's safe, what do you need to do right now to make her safe? Who are you going to get on side to help you? Certainly, we have um, we certainly have a community mental health team here in town, which would be able to help me. But I also have the ability to be able to admit people for short stays if I thought that was going to help. And I've done that in the past. That might not be a, a good option for Tanya. She's she's going to have two kids at home. We need to kind of work out the practicalities of her being able to come in. But sometimes it gives people a chance to actually come in and just just take the heat off and defuse. She comes back the next day, and for me, again, you know, as I said, you've really got to give her enough time. Um, the, the idea here is that you're wanting to try to just start that therapeutic relationship. It's not going to be built in just one day. Um, you really bet to start getting her trust and getting a rapport and, and aiming to provide her somewhere safe that she can just get start to unload some of the things that are troubling her. Um, I don't have to teach you to suck eggs. We're all GPs and we do this stuff day to day. But, you know, the full medical history is important. All of, every mental health patient has medical comorbidities that we need not ignore. Um, we know that she's overweight. Um, we know that she's hypertensive. We can't ignore all the kind of background stuff. We're there to, to look after them in, in a um, whole. Try to get a full psych history. Um, that's always a challenge, but certainly it's something I enjoy chipping away and working out. But but remember also, you don't have to get all of this now. I mean, you've got time up your sleeve. Sometimes digging too deep in things is actually detrimental to your cause. I do think it's important to know about her medications. Again, I think finding out what she's on now and if she's taking them, what she's been on in the past and how they went 
and why they were stopped, and also her alcohol and other drugs history. You know, how much is she drinking? You've got this kind of wishy-washy collateral from one of your staff members, but really, what is she taking um, in her social time? Um, get an accurate idea of her current social circumstances. As I kind of touched on before, you don't want to find out suddenly that she'll be homeless the minute she walks out of your door. Do you need social work help? You know, is there other things you can do for her? Family history and background, I, I've, you'll see there that I've, I've said to do this cautiously. It's not the time and place to suddenly dig up her past traumatic history. I, I think you really need to have the grounding and the trust before you go delving too deep into that kind of stuff. Sometimes it comes out and it, it just happens that way. But certainly I wouldn't go digging too far. I've put set some rules and I guess it ties in a little bit with the benzodiazepines and we see that she's had analgesic prescriptions and stuff in the before, in the past before. And I certainly, as a general rule, kind of get a, I hate the word contract, but have a kind of a, a deal with the patient that, look, I, I'm going to make the effort to see you and I'm going to see you as regularly as you need to be seen, but you come and see me. You know, you get your scripts from me, you see me for the time being, it gets too confusing seeing other people. And I find most people don't really mind that. I do think it's worthwhile exploring some of the reasons why she might not be able to see you or why she might be finding it hard to see a GP. Does she have a car, for example? You know, is, is her, are her finances completely um, troubling her? You know, we have a private billing practice here, but we make arrangements. If people really can't afford to pay, then we, we make arrangements to try to use item numbers and use care plans and whatnot, as I'm sure you all do, to allow us to see Tanya without it costing her too much. And then from there, I also arrange my next appointment. She has that appointment in her hand before she goes. And depending on the situation, that might be in two days' time, it might be in a week, it might be two weeks. I can't, again, it's one of those things that's a bit rubbery depending on the person. But really for me, I think that it's all about um, the logistics of that initial consult. I find it so challenging, and as again, as I'm sure you all do. But I think time, if I had to really summarise it, time would be the one thing that we need to try to find as best we can. And I will leave it there. Thanks very much, David. Now, I'd like to um, welcome Iggy, who's the mental health nurse on our panel tonight. And um, once again, Iggy's got a really interesting um, first slide. So, Iggy, thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, look, I think uh, what, what David has outlined are some very, you know, lots of innovative um, angles of uh, approach on, on what is going to be truly a, a challenging situation. And with a caveat in mind that, you know, um, that the folks tonight are going to be working in a very busy primary care setting. Um, what I wanted to do was focus on just some, I guess, more principles of approach and understanding of the situation rather than, um, I guess, certain sort of set, um, you know, things that one might do. Um, because I think um, the important thing is that yeah, we, we don't, um, we, we shy away as much as possible from a very task focused approach and, and uh, right from the get go understand that someone like Tanya is going to experience, um, you know, things like institutions, agencies, healthcare settings um, in a rather sort of threatened way. Um, I mean, her, her trauma background means that whole experience of the world is one that's quite um, dangerous and threatening. Um, so with that in mind, um, I guess um, the way I would sum it up is that right from the beginning of, of any interaction that, um, that healthcare workers would have with someone like Tanya, um, so bear in mind that the relationship, the interaction is the actual treatment. How we approach and, and engage and, and interact with someone like Tanya is actually part of the, the clinical care, the clinical treatment from the front desk right through to the consulting room. Um, and so, you know, um, I guess a, a, a way to approach that might be to, to just continue to ask oneself internally how, how to minimise harm. Now, in saying that, I'm not suggesting in any way that you know, any of us are out to, to deliberately sort of provoke or harm a, a person such as Tanya, but um, I think bearing in mind her, her sense of place in the world 
um, there are lots of um, you know, potential for um, inadvertent harm that, that we need to be mindful of, um, especially um, as David mentioned when a person brings in a baggage of, of a whole range of prior interactional histories and, and use of services that may not have gone the best, um, that may have caused um, you know, tension um, in, in that relationship that really is part of the, the, the whole treatment. So um, I think uh, important to bear in mind that as part, you know, bear in mind that the relationship is the treatment. Um, you know, our contribution as healthcare professionals um, to to that relationship from the very beginning, and and all of the staff that are part of our services, um, you know, are, are exerting an impact right from the beginning, um, and that's why I think it's particularly important to reevaluate and and really reframe how we might understand what are very difficult and challenging behaviours and move away from, um, I guess, making clinical assessments or, or, or judgments um, on the basis of outward behaviours alone. Um, because once we start doing that, I think um, sort of pejorative understandings can come into play and, and we can lock into, um, into a situation that could quite easily polarise. I mean, I'm just looking at the case study where um, the sort of front desk staff are, are sort of talking about this patient and, and being a small community. I mean, the, the, the sort of um, things that get known about particular people and how that might influence and, and, and that, that, that whole interaction, that, that, um, that relationship from, uh, from the front desk onwards um, is important to, to bear in mind. So, you know, reevaluating, for instance, common things that are said about people like Tanya that their, their attention seeking, their constant use of service is something that's, that's, that's about seeking attention. Um, I think it's important to understand that with her um, complex trauma history and going back into childhood, um, we're essentially looking at somebody who's never been able to you know, healthily and safely attach and that, that, that's, what, that's what she continues to do on in, in, in adult life. And someone with a history of unsafe attachments where these things have often escalate. Um, and, and can cause uh, relationship breakdowns. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Tanya is somebody who is likely to push and pull in, in relationships. Um, her, her sense of boundaries are going to be damaged from that, that trauma history and how much we push and pull in return will, will matter. Um, and I think we can, um, you know, at, at times mirror um, Tanya's sort of you know, sharp lurches between feeling victimised and, and being a victimiser herself. Um, so again, just to reiterate that the, the care take the, the care that we need to take in using you know things like limit setting and boundaries, and that um, you know they're not they're not done in a way that that um, you know puts the cart before the horse. Because um, in my mind, you know, the whole issue of boundaries only makes sense for someone like Tanya. Um, you know, in a, in a safe enough, a good enough relationship. And that's not to say, of course, that we, we somehow, you know, approach every situation like this as if we're walking on eggshells um, and become sort of overthinking about how we might approach these relationships. Um, I think it's, it's more about, you know, uh, maintaining a genuine, interested um, engagement to, to help that sort of therapeutic relationship along. and. If falling out happens, if relationships do get disrupted or broken down, um, what's more important is that, that follow through commitment to trying to, to pick up the pieces and repair that relationship um, rather than you know, trying sort of to, to avoid um, any problems altogether because inadvertently, inadvertently I think and inevitably we're going to encounter you know, rocks and bumps along the way in a, in a treatment relationship like this. Um, And bearing that in mind again, um, on the basis of the previous two slides, um, I think it's, it's important to recognise that all staff in an agency, a service, um, from non-clinical to clinical staff are actually also part of the treatment relationship. Um, again, it's, it's about safety from the front desk right through to the consulting room. Um, how do we actually you know, support and, and bring together all staff so that we're in communication with each other, we're all on the same page as much as possible, 
and we're all concertedly trying to bring about a situation of providing as much safety in the interaction in the relationship as possible with someone like Tanya. Um, so that also means providing enough support for non-clinical staff to be able to debrief and talk out some of the difficulties they might have at the, at the front line of, of contact with, um, with, with Tanya. Um, and accounting for the possibility that we're working, we may be working with staff with their own trauma histories. Um, you know, there really is no species barrier between consumers and staff when it comes to trauma. As Cathy said, it's, it's prevalent, it's, um, it's a social problem above all, um, and uh, that needs to be borne in mind. So, you know, adequate education, debriefing, um, clinical supervision of all staff, I think, you know, including non-clinical staff may not be um, such a bad thing um, to, to try and, yeah, cohere that, that sort of shared approach of one that emphasises safety of, of the interaction of the relationship for all sides concerned. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's it's really about how one is and 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 the the, the, the sort of way it's it's a way of being when it comes to working with complex trauma rather than sort of technical interventions or technical tools, you know, about doing X or Y or trying X or Y and saying to the patient to try X or Y. Um, I think for me, um, any of those sort of technical interventions, technical tools, clinical tools, um, psychological tools and interventions are only good as the, the quality of the relatedness, of the relationship um, that that does take time to develop and, and I understand that that would be a very tricky thing in a, in a busy primary care setting um, but perhaps over time, um, you know, not feeling like we need to do it in one go but over time to, to work towards the safety of that relationship that allows those sorts of strategies and tools to be used safely um, with someone like Tanya and to be grounded and, 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 and um, guided as much, I suppose, by, by sort of adequate clinical understandings and a framework um, that can help make sense of, of building that relationship and that can guide the relationship and safely couch interventions like, for instance, CDT. Um, and here I'd have to say that um, ASCA provides excellent training um, for all clinicians and, and, and range of uh, health professionals on complex trauma and be very useful for people, whether they work in mental health or not, primary care or, or in other settings, to um, to get the benefits of that sort of training um, to, to gain that sort of critical grounding and framework and theory that, that will guide um, how to conduct those relationships safely. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Iggy. Um, now, Louise, um, I very much welcome your response to this as a psychiatrist. And um, I've, there's, some, there's some particular questions around diagnosis and things which we might come up to in the panel, the panel discussion. Um, thank you very much for presenting your response to Tanya. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of um, very good points have already been made, and obviously one of the, the difficulties is people who might present with a history of complex trauma in most primary care settings is that you've often got crisis-driven presentations, whether the crisis in our mind um, is a small issue or a larger issue for the person coming along and help seeking, it symbolises. Um, a very uh, big issue, which is one of difficulties in feeling safe in relationships, um, having difficulties in help seeking, on the one hand seeking a lot of help, but then sometimes from our perspective rejecting it or being inconsistent in following advice. So that immediately sets up these complex relationships that we can have um, with individuals who are highly traumatised. We feel ourselves um, disempowered or we're trying to establish workable relationships and seemingly nothing we do um, can help that person um, be more contained. So, and that's one of the major challenges. How do we set up a relationship where there are feelings of safety where maybe over time a, a person can be helped to deal with some of the, um, the ways in which trauma has affected uh, their emotional states, their behaviour and importantly their self-regulation. So these are people who often um, go between extreme to presentation um, and find life um, very challenging. So those are our problems um, as clinicians in many ways, but we do have to manage that clinical interaction. Psychiatrists might get called in um, if there are issues and they're available, but if there are questions about risk, particularly if someone's repeatedly 
presenting with self-harming behaviours or suicidal uh, ideation, or if um, people are worried that someone's actually developed um, severe uh, clinical uh, depression uh, along with daily life um, stress and crises, or um, which occasionally, of course, can, can be an issue where someone becomes extremely distressed in a post-traumatic way, meaning that they're having experiences um, of remembering or going back to events which have been very damaging and very traumatising, so more a picture of PTSD. So sometimes there are those sorts of um, questions to, to be worked out. Over time, and I'm not saying that this can be done um, immediately, and it might be only um, possible over a longer period of time, it is important, if we can, to try and find out about someone's background. Um, usually when people present with these um, very complex pictures of trauma-related um, symptoms and difficulties, they have experienced significant early maltreatment. So during critical developmental periods, um, particularly those periods of rapid neurodevelopment, so brain growth and organisation, that's going to be very significant in terms of our understanding someone's core difficulties. They might then have those core difficulties related to emotional control, uh, so difficulties in mood regulation uh, and ongoing trauma-related uh, symptoms, as well as those most important difficulties in dealing with other attachment relationships. So we frequently see people who've experienced early attachment and trauma really working very hard to try and establish those relationships, but sometimes failing that or making poor choices in relationships, being unable to judge relationships, so we see patterns of relational disturbance. But very painful uh, experiences for people who, like anyone else, are trying to establish a sense of safety and security with others. These um, are also people who might have had terrible experiences of making disclosures of abuse or maltreatment and not being believed or validated in terms of those experiences. That might make it, again, even harder for them to seek help or to form trusting relationships with clinicians or people who might actually uh, be helpful because they're never sure that that relationship is going to be sustained or um, won't be betrayed in some way. So that is a very powerful um, dynamic. So early trauma um, itself can influence development um, in the broader sense. So we're talking about not just people um, functioning in terms of relationships, but also how they experience themselves, how they can or can't use um, other relationships. And these are people who are much more likely, as in this case, to have problems with trying to self-regulate through inappropriate use of drugs or alcohol, having a whole range of bodily experiences, um, which we can think about as related to early trauma, pain of unknown uh, origin, multiple somatic experiences, which can be very disturbing. Um, and a whole range of anxiety uh, related presentations as well. Um, so certainly there's no one single way in which someone like this might present, no one single clinical picture. And the challenge for, for us as clinicians, I think, is to have that trauma-aware, um, open state of mind when complex people uh, present to us and to have a very high index of suspicion that uh, that person may have had a whole range of um, traumatic experiences. The most significant, of course, being um, trauma in the early years, trauma at the hands of attachment figures. So the people who were meant to be protective um, had actually uh, betrayed that relationship and abused um, that child. So again, it's not DSM is not particularly helpful. Um, it's not helpful in many ways, but it's not helpful as regards trauma or the developmental impact of trauma um, because uh, virtually the whole range of symptoms that the DSM describes can appear in people who've experienced um, early trauma. So a way of summarising that is to think about how can we better understand and talk to someone in a way that helps us get a handle on how they experience themselves so that we can then um, use that to guide how we structure a relationship with them, but particularly to understand what things might trigger very severe uh, or anxiety um, states or angry outbursts or whatever the issues are. And there are usually triggers for these, interpersonal triggers uh, or feelings um, that are, uh, are re recalling past negative events. And we see people in desperate ways trying to make themselves feel regrouped um, and um, more stable. The DSM might call those, some of those things symptoms of particular um, disturbances, but in a functional way, 
visualised people can often be attempting to self-regulate. Sometimes we will see very complex responses um, to stress, so people who might um, become very dysregulated, so extremely angry, um, repetitive self-harm, ongoing risk um, of um, suicidal behaviour, and, and sadly um, completed uh, suicide is not uncommon uh, in, in this group, of course. Um, but people who might um, very easily get themselves into situations where they're re-traumatised, so re-victimised, um, and that's a very distressing uh, phenomenon. The other thing, I, a point I make about Tanya and many people in this situation is that they're actually parents uh, and trying um, as best they can to parent in a safe way their own children. But of course, uh, there, is, um, there are issues brought up um, in the relationships with their children that might actually remind the person of the issues that they've had, the abuse they've suffered in the past. So parenting can become a very challenging experience, hard relationships for people with complex trauma history. Some are very anxious um, about repeating um, negative interactions with their own children and things that they've experienced. Some will um, actually, um, some people will present wanting to talk about being, being a parent in the face of having experienced trauma and abuse and the impact that might have on their own capacity to protect these parents. So these are very complex relationships. So we need to think um, in terms of our clinical response um, as other speakers have stressed, this issue of how we better engage with people. How can we set up safe relationships where there are clear boundaries and a shared understanding of the focus of clinical work that we might do? Everyone has stressed the need for time for, for someone like this and um, it's absolutely essential. Uh, actually having a proactive approach of booking appointments, whether they might be necessary or not, if that's possible, so the person has a, a sense of ongoing connection and support, whether that's with the, the GP or other people in the practice, um, or if you have access to psychology, um, to be able to have that sort of backup um, as a way of helping contain someone's understandable anxiety. I would avoid um, what I call making premature diagnoses. Um, or becoming too um, uh, reliant on the DSM. Um, I think the DSM has limited utility. Um, sometimes it's very uh, helpful, but in the trauma-related um, framework, not particularly. Um, so maintaining our uh, capacity to think about trauma and how it has affected person, uh, people and how man much many of the symptoms, so called, that we see are actually ways that someone has tried to survive in a dangerous environment. Children who are abused live in states of fear and live in dangerous environments. And what they do uh, in that situation as best they can are uh, use whatever mechanisms they have for self-protection. That's an adaptive response in a, um, in a very dangerous environment. We do need them to be able to um, obviously use our skills about listening and, and containing someone, but essentially to validate um, their lived experience. And their, um, and, um, their attempts to put their own story together. We need to be guided by people who come to see us um, about the pace at which we do that. And those are hard decisions sometimes, but essentially uh, people will um, give us a lot of signals about what they can tolerate and what they can't, and we need to be guided by that. And the last point I'd make is to think about um, self-care if you're in the position of working a lot with highly traumatised people um, with very, um, very disturbing uh, stories sometimes um, that uh, we, uh, we might get to hear about over a period of time. That, of course, can have effects on all of us. And we do need to be aware um, of any um, of the uh, more complex reactions um, uh, that we have. So whilst we're trained um, um, in terms of basic clinician approaches to try and deal with someone's um, anxieties and help people deal with their own emotional states, which is what we mean, mean by containment, so acting as someone who can help be a support for person, a person experiencing strong and dysregulating emotions, we need to be aware that that can happen to us as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Louise. I'm just um, observing the comments from the participants and there's lots of really good nuts and bolts discussions about how we make these um, quite complex treatment arrangements under Medicare, which is not very nuanced. Um, 
and I also I'm 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 going to allow I'm <laughs> like Kathy to talk about the um, ASCA pr principles of trauma informed practice. But I'm just observing at this stage that we've talked about Tanya for over half an hour, and no one has mentioned the words borderline personality disorder yet. So I promise you, we're going to revisit that. And there's also a very interesting question about um, she has a request that we write a letter or phone her boss today. So I'm going to come back to that as well. David, I might put you on notice for that one. Um, <laughs> Kathy, if I can just invite you to talk about how we can look after people um, like Tanya in a trauma-informed way. Look, I think obviously the other panellists have um, covered this very, very well. And I think you know the, the principle here is firstly to have trauma on the radar, as Louise said, uh, and to, to remember the impacts of trauma, understand trauma dynamics. And these core principles um, really reflect what people have said already. Um, principles of safety. Some people who have experienced complex trauma have never felt safe. That's an absolutely foreign concept. And it can take a long time you know, for people to feel physically and emotionally safe. To learn to trust when people have been betrayed, you know, by their primary caregiver. It take, can take, you know, a long, long time to trust. So, um, as Louise said, you know, what, one needs to work at the pace that the person brings to you, um, not to push them forward uh, where they don't want to go. Um, to, to be able to make choices, you know, some people have experienced, some survivors um, don't even know um, that they can make a choice. They wouldn't know what what that means, what they want, what their wishes, what their desires are. They never, they've never asked themselves that. To collaborate, um, you know, when people have been abused in an imbalance of power, uh, and certainly when one comes to see the doctor, that's an authority figure. Um, so it can feel hierarchical uh, and it can replicate what's happened in prior abuse quite inadvertently, um, you know, I'm not implying uh, any ill intentions here. So remembering that, remembering uh, how someone can, can present and how someone can feel. And of course, um, empowering people. So acknowledging that to have survived um, in whatever way people coped um, is a strength. And to help people acknowledge those strengths and build on them. And of course, absolutely core, what happened to the person. Thinking about the person in the context of their life. Because when we think about people in the context of their trauma, uh, then the way they've coped, the way they're presenting their challenges uh, makes very good sense. We need to remember that there is hope, there is optimism research, and there's a lot of research out there. Um, you know, ASCA's guidelines put together 20 years of research around complex trauma. Uh, we know that even early trauma can be resolved. Uh, and then when parents have dealt with their trauma, their children can obviously do a lot better. And we shouldn't underestimate that every interaction, as, as Iggy said, is absolutely critical from um, the person at the front desk um, to, to um, we, we've done training for, for cleaners in, in, in hospital situations because they have a lot of patient interaction. Um, with social beings, uh, the brain is plastic, so those interactions uh, and the power of, um, of, of positive interactions to repair the damage, um, for ruptures to repair, for those new brain pathways to be laid down, absolutely critical. Um, and I think, um, look, it's been so well covered. I think, you know, back to you, Mary, the discussion. Thanks, Cathy. Well, the burning question that keeps popping up is, are we going to ring um, Tanya's boss? And I don't expect you to know a perfect answer, David, but you might start the discussion. Thank you. Actually, I thought maybe in case people don't have the case study, I might just quickly read out what the question is. So um, you asked how you can help her today. She tells you that her boss has just told her that she's used all of her sick leave and in future any time off will be unpaid. She accuses her boss of not understanding and explains that without an income she will struggle to pay the rent. This is what she says. I do my best with my kids. I've worked at that shop on and off for 15 years and this is the thanks I get. It's not my fault I got chronic fatigue and you guys haven't been able to help me, so I figure you're going to have to help me now. I need you to call my boss and explain. David. Now I can't hear David. Yeah. Uh, 
David, I think you might have your phone on mute. I can see you talking. Ah, right. Sorry. I'll fix that. No, that's good. Thanks. Look, Mary, sorry, pardon, pardon me. Um, in the time I've been practicing, I haven't called anyone's boss yet. So um, I suspect in that time I have learned ways of um, getting around it. I usually kind of explain what that means to them, um, me getting involved in that kind of thing, and explain that it's not really... Um, you know, I've kind of explained what I can do and what I can't do, and I, and I don't think that going outside the therapeutic relationship, especially early on and talking to a boss is necessarily helpful. And when I explain that to patients, they often uh, actually say, well, yeah, you know what, I actually don't really think you should talk to my boss about this stuff. So I know that's a kind of a wishy-washy answer, but once I actually sit down and talk to people normally and I explain the kind of what their rights are as an employee and um, about all that kind of stuff, usually people don't push the issue. That makes sense, Kathy. If you were Tanya, how would um, how would you feel if the doctor that you that you've just come to see today wouldn't do that for you, or how might you respond? Look, I mean, I'm angry with the world anyway, so um, you know, I already feel out of control. Um, you know, I'd probably feel betrayed. I, I wouldn't understand it. I mean, it would depend on my pre-existing relationship. I, mm. I would think with, with the doctor. Uh, where there was a whether there was a degree of trust, uh, whether there had been uh, prior positive interactions that I perceived as positive, um, but you know I'm I'm desperate. Um, uh, I don't really know. I think I know what I want, but uh, but I'm very confused and I'm bouncing all over the place. So I I, I may find that very difficult. Mm. I, I should say, can, I should say, um, I haven't called anyone, but I have, and I kind of said this in my little tiny presentation that I have written letters for people before, if they want to, and the reason why I've done letters instead of calling people is because I allow them to um, to read what I'm going to say beforehand and try to see if they're happy with the wording and to make sure that I'm not going to have something that's going to just blow up on me down the track. I really do explain a lot of those implications to people because I, I think a lot of people don't realise their rights. And but I do appreciate what Kathy just said that mm. done in the wrong way, it could really come back as yet another person um, kicking them in the gut. Look, you know, I, I, did, I didn't say this was easy, easy David. I was uh, I was on the your side of the desk as well. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very challenging. Now I would like to come back. I think I. Perhaps, well, Iggy, you asked a really interesting question, which I think relates a bit to, I mean, uh, Tanya probably fits the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. We've talked a lot about how we might respond to her without mentioning that at all. And you asked a question that in complex trauma, what you see is not always what you get. So should we throw out the DSM? And I noticed Louise saying that it, it, it wasn't always um, terribly valid but sometimes it was useful and I just I just wondered if you could comment on the whole idea of borderline in this kind of presentation. Um, look I uh, just from speaking from my own experiences it's um, uh, a, a bit of a, a an issue for me how healthcare systems and mental health services have become so drummed into responding to complex trauma and the distresses and all the other sort of complex sequelae that come out of complex trauma in, in very behavioural fashion, uh, or biobehavioural really, um, where um, you know, clients, consumers uh, are, are responded to on the basis of outward behaviour. And if that outward behaviour is aggression, is, is seen to be challenging and difficult, um, then it, it's a sort of a like for like, fire, fire with fire approach sometimes. And, um, <sighs> And, and that's where it gets into this whole discussion about risk and, and you know, how, how we deal with risk. Uh, my, my concern is that sometimes outward behaviour can actually um, be very different to what that outward behaviour is often defending, defending against mm -hmm. for somebody with complex trauma. I mean, often terror, a deep sense of shame about oneself can be manifest in um, aggressive presentations and, and if it's met with simply on the basis of aggression alone, 
it can actually fuel and escalate the whole the whole problem. Um, so that I guess that's what I'm uh, getting at is that when it comes to complex trauma, it's, it's uh, really important to shy away from surface judgments on the basis of what you're seeing, um, and uh, and just just be a little bit more, um, yeah, uh, trying to sense into something a bit more that's going on for that person, and you know, acknowledging for someone like Tanya the fact that you know, despite all her ups and downs, I mean, she's for some. Uh, she's been able to sustain some level of employment all this time. Um, you know, and like validating, acknowledging that might actually be a way into um, getting behind that that aggressive outward. Well, I'm not saying it's purely superficial, but that aggressive manifestation of, of all of those relational turbulences that are going on underneath. And, and I don't think that's why I don't think the DSM really helps to guide our responses to that to speak. So really, with what coming back to what you said about the relationship being the place in which the work is done rather than a diagnostic framework. Um, Louise, I w I'd be really interested in um, what you think about the actual label or diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, um, which, which does get made and, and has some use sometimes. Um, but obviously, as a psychiatrist, you're, you're probably expected to make diagnoses more often than we are. Um, how do you weigh up these, these different kind of ways of thinking about somebody like Tanya? I think there are two separate issues. There's one of whether we have to, for reasons of documentation or of hospital systems, mental health systems, use the DSM diagnoses, which um, in many ways we do. And, um, and that may be reasonable if they're understood as pretty shorthand, limited ways of describing um, the way people might present. Uh, however, the DSM system is not explanatory. Um, and prides itself actually on not telling us about causal factors or really going into that. And our job as clinicians and as people who are trying to understand things in a psychological trauma-informed framework is, as you said, to try and understand the meaning behind behaviour. And when that doesn't happen, it's, um, it's exactly when we see problems of people using diagnostic labels as if they explain everything in a premature way and sadly in a very pejorative way. And of the borderline uh, term um, has become absolutely laden with pejorative um, uh, meaning. So we assume that those people who attract that label are going to be difficult individuals who are going to try and get things from us and be manipulative. And this sort of language is used quite often about people. And what that does, it stops people thinking about the why question. What has happened to this person? Why is interpersonal functioning so difficult for them? What trauma-related symptoms are they experiencing and how can we best work with them? And uh, usually getting a label um, doesn't guide us in that way. I should say, however, that there are some individual um, individuals who come for treatment who themselves have looked at the DSM system, have gone through the diagnostic criteria and might be interested in which apply to them, which things actually do seem um, to um, explain some of their self-experience, in which case I think we do need to talk with people about that. Um, there's a, a lot of argument about whether we should actually get rid of the whole borderline diagnostic category and talk much more about complex um, trauma responses, um, which I think is probably much more, um, much more useful. Um, sadly, in DSM-5, um, there was a proposal that was being discussed um, for a condition that was a condition about developmental trauma that explained a lot of the um, features that we're discussing tonight, but that didn't get into the DSM, uh, the new DSM, which is unfortunate. So the DSM is a pretty um, rough and ready guide um, to, to many issues, and I think we, we should not use it in a way um, and pretend that it explains everything because it doesn't. Thanks very much, Louise. And I guess my understanding is that the term borderline actually came out of really out of psychoanalytic thinking that there was um, people who had neurosis and people who had psychosis, and borderline presentations were people who sometimes presented with neurotic features and sometimes with psychotic features. Yes. So it's actually so that's quite in an the late the late 1930s where there was um, yeah. a really discussion about where these people. Um, would fit within an existing system and essentially didn't fit. So, that, so they were somewhere um, on the border of neurosis and psychosis. Um, and, and, yeah. and it developed them. Yeah. 
And I think for me, the, the fact that their symptoms can, can be so severe actually indicates the level of, of, the, of their distress and often the level of damage that, that they've experienced in their lives. Yes. Um, now, um, I would like to invite Iggy back in. Um, Iggy, how, how would we know if, if we are GPs trying to refer someone for additional support because we've recognised that this is going to take um, more than the GP and it's going to take a, a team approach and, and some really good counselling. How would a GP know um, what, what kind of clinician to refer to, particularly if, if we're not going to go down diagnostic paths? How do we know what treatments are going to be effective? How do we know that, that an allied health professional has got the skills and experience to deal with this kind of complexity? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the database of um, clinicians who work with complex trauma that ASCA has collated. So um, this might be a question um, just as pertinent for, for Cathy. Um, there are also, um, I suppose, you know, psychotherapy associations. I'm a member of one myself that um, do specialise in treatment modalities um, of this variety that encompass a whole variety of mental health clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, social workers and others um, who are trained um, in particular modalities like the conversational model for instance um, and that's the data based <coughs> um, uh, Yeah, look, um, it, you know, having said that though, it's not, not always um, straightforward, um, you know, making a referral, especially if they can't um, you know, afford private therapies um, and, and long-term private therapies. Um, yeah, look, I, I guess, yeah, that, that that's always a tough, tricky one that we um, come up against. I was talking to a colleague today and, you know, often folks like Tanya get bounced around from services to services and um, everyone seems to put people like that in a too hard basket and, and we don't have specialised complex therapy services unfortunately that are publicly funded. I know, I know there are a couple of good outpatient psychotherapy services here and there um, in Sydney and, and New South Wales but... Um, but I suppose many of us have got what, we, what we've got access to is, is um, allied health professionals who and patients like this often can't afford long term private therapy so they can get 10 sessions per year under Medicare and there's a, I don't think we can even answer it now whether sometimes Engaging for ten sessions and having to disengage sometimes might be more more harm than good. In, but anyway, David, I particularly want to ask you about this because you're working in Longreach, so I, I don't imagine that you have a selection of trauma informed local therapists to choose from that Bolt Bill and that Tanya is prepared to see and doesn't <coughs> know from primary school or mm. the supermarket. So what do you do in a rural area? Oh uh, look, I. I knew this question was coming. It's very hard, um, basically. I, on the plus side, we actually do have quite a few clinicians in town who do mental health. Um, they, there are some issues. On the, on the very plus side, they're all free. Okay, So that, that's a big bonus in the sense that people can often engage for long periods of time. But the reason why they're free is because their funding comes from lots of different places. Um, the Royal Flying Doctors, um, some people might not know, but in Longreach they have a, a non-clinical uh, base, a non-retrieval base that have a purely mental health hub. And so they have quite a strong mental health team in town here with a couple of mental health nurses, two or three psychologists and a social worker all in um, the one office. Plus there's community mental health, which I mentioned, and also a lot, a lot of periphery kind of non-government organisations. But at the end of the day, the workforce throughout all those places is very transient. Um, for example, in the community mental health team, I think that they're funded for about 11 positions, but they've only got three or four filled at the moment. And most people only stay for a short amount of time. And the skills people bring with them can be really varied. Um, people, in the time I've been working here, we've only had one clinician who's had a fair bit of experience in dealing with trauma. And the problems actually occur, unfortunately, when, when she left town, it actually kind of was difficult. She'd engaged with quite a lot of people and then had to leave because of the social circumstances and that was traumatic in itself. But lately I have been experimenting with um, having patients fly down to see a psychiatrist for a couple of visits so they can get that kind of initial face-to-face -face, in the room kind of experience. And then there's a couple of psychiatrists who are happy to see people over telehealth which is 
been interesting. I, I haven't done it with trauma. I've done it with other things um, like depression and anxiety, and so I'm not really not sure how it would work with complex trauma. But certain, And I'd love to um, hear Louise's opinion on that. But it's, it's an interesting option in this day and age. Thank you. Thanks, David. And um, Cassie's just put up the uh, link to, well, Nikki put up the ASCA website, and um, people can actually ring ASCA themselves, as can practitioners for advice around these kind of questions. Um, Louise, I wondered, we're actually approaching the end of our time, so I wondered if you could answer David's question about how you feel telepsychiatry might go with this kind of issue, but also then have an opportunity to just give us any final summing up points. Look, I think that the telepsychiatry is sometimes um, a very usable option. It's not going to give um, the same, I guess, interpersonal connection in many ways, but it can really be useful in getting a, another opinion um, on some of the, the questions that might uh, come up and giving the person a sense that the relationship and treatment that they're having is probably very useful for them. So I think if it's done in that sort of way for these sorts of patients, it can be yet another um, validated sort of experience. So it's all about how we how we use it. Well, obviously, you're not going to do long-term um, therapy or intervention um, generally by by teleconferencing, but for clinicians on the ground, it can also be a way of um, supporting them in what what they're doing. I think for me, um, just um, a couple of some summary sentences after what we've been discussing. It's been really, um, I think, important that everyone um, involved has stressed this issue about relationships and the importance of trying as best we can to understand someone's history and experience even if they can't tell us um, and don't, or maybe don't want to tell us or disclose in a very fragmented way some of the details. We, we try and maintain that focus of having an open um, mind and being receptive um, and keeping a trauma focused in, in our work. We um, also all seem to stress the importance of trying to recreate a sense of safety, putting some time into people, planning ahead, building up a, um, structures around someone, if you like, that might help someone feel a bit more together in terms of their emotional experience. No one underestimates the difficulty of some of the clinical issues that come up with patients like this. And of course, tonight um, we haven't gone into all these issues about different sorts of treatment modalities, but I think important to stress that there are evidence-based approaches, there's a lot of research has gone on into helping people with these sorts of um, these sorts of states and conditions. And the treatment outlook is much more positive now than, than it has been. Thanks very much, Louise. Now Iggy, this is um, maybe it's a loaded question and I'm asking you because you're not a GP. I my sense is that, for example, in David's town where people come and go, the GP often seems to be the you know, consistent um, personnel in the town. And, and I, my observation is that I think just a, a consistent, reliable relationship with a GP over a long period of time can in itself be therapeutic and it can give someone an experience of, you know, that consistency and containment. And the GP obviously needs to have supports around them to do that, particularly if they have a lot of clients like this. But I just wondered, you know, what, what your observations and experience have been over time, whether you've seen that actually just that sometimes enough. Yeah, no, that that's actually very true. I've had I've had clients who've reported to me very good relationships with GPs that provide that emotional holding environment that um, helps you know just attenuate the worst of their distresses and and can help them through the, these sorts of difficulties and avoid the sort of you know sharp escalations and sharp sort of falls that can ups and downs that can often happen in these sorts of relationships. Um, and yeah, look, I think, um, you know, um, there, there's no reason why, you know, um, um, primary care practitioners, GPs, um, other healthcare professionals um, um, couldn't, um, you know, gain additional sort of skills to, to work with complex trauma, um, um, you know, bearing in mind the importance of sort of you know, ways of, of managing these relationships. It, it, it really is all in, 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 the, in the, 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 the relationship management that is so crucial. And, you know, it, it, it can be complicated, but there's also, you know, a, a sort of a no-brainer side to it in some way, some genuine human concern, you know, with a clear sense of boundaries and, and adequate sort of support and supervision of, of, of that um, can be very, very helpful. 
Um, I think, you know, in, in healthcare environments, what we often fall into the trap of is we've got to sort of be, be constantly doing something, you know, to, to, to fill the space and, and the pressure of doing that can often exert sorts of um, turbulences where it's just, you know, maintaining certain boundary, compassionate human responses over a long period of time and, and not feeling like we have to achieve everything, you know, in an all or nothing fashion can itself often be very helpful. Um, yeah, especially where there are limited resources available. Thanks very much for that, Iggy, and I think that's been your key message all the way along, that the, the relationship is the, the really important therapeutic thing. Um, now, David, I just wondered if you had any couple of um, final things that you wanted to say? Uh, n not really, Mary. I, I think what Iggy just said then is exactly right, and I think it's kind of mirrored a little bit in a few of the comments about the you know, being human with people and just spending time and listening and, and stability, it's, um, it certainly plays a big role in, in helping people along the line. You might feel completely out of your depth, but you might not realise how much good you do. Thanks very much, David. And then, Cathy, I'd like to bring you in just to find, um, finish up with a couple of points that you want us to make sure we remember. Well, I think the role of the GP is, is so critical, the opportunity to engage with uh, people on an ongoing basis and to build that relationship um, enables the possibility of, of, of a relationship of support and a relationship that maybe not therapeutic in, in the traditional sense but is therapeutic over time. Um, so maintaining that trauma lens, obviously, absolutely critical um, and understanding um, people holistically as human beings treating people uh, with human principles which are really what trauma-informed principles are. Thank you very much. Look I'd just really like to thank um, the whole panel. I think it's been a really interesting discussion and I, I you know once again there's just no way we can cover the enormity of someone like Tanya's, even her initial presentation, let alone following her up over, over months and years. Um, it's been great having all of, all of your um, input and I would in, really encourage the uh, participants to consider coming back for the second and third webinar. So the next one's on screening, assessing and recognising complex trauma and that's on Monday the 5th of May. So that's, that's actually moving on a little down the track and this will be part two of Tanya's story. And then um, on that one she's referred to an allied health professional. And then the, the third one on the 11th of June will be working therapeutically with complex trauma. So that will be a lot more about what kinds of um, treatment modalities have evidence around them and what kinds of things work. And I think the whole thing is going to be underpinned by the, the points that everybody's just so beautifully illustrated today, that the relationship itself is, is really important. And that I really liked what Iggy said about there's no species separation between the staff and the patient, we're actually all human. And sometimes we need to know how to look after ourselves and stay safe. And um, in that, within that, we need to just allow ourselves to be human. And I think it's very, very powerful. I actually think there's also great symbolic power of, of the doctor, which, which we, we can use strategically and can be really helpful. We don't often talk about that. So perhaps we'll in future webinars. Can I encourage everybody to stay on and uh, fill out the exit survey and to also just be aware that the Mental Health Professional Network um, runs a whole series of webinars. There's a whole lot uh, stored online on their website if you want to go and look at any of the historical ones and there are also often local networks in your area so if you're interested in meeting up with um, other clinicians who have an interest in mental health, whether they're allied health professionals, psychiatrists, other GPs, um, I'd encourage you to participate in those. Thanks very much everyone for coming along tonight and if the panellists can just stay online briefly and good night and thank you very much to all the participants.